Hi, this is Eric Funk, one of the co-founders of Red Mountain Radio, LLC. We've been providing RF design services to clients in the electronics industry since 2003. In 2011, we also purchased an FM broadcast signal near our location in Southwest Colorado, and we built out the station from its construction permit stage. It's been on the air ever since. One of the most important engineering aspects of operating an FM station is setting the modulation index properly. Since the audio levels of the station's programming content can just be all over the map, how is it that stations on the dial all appear to be operating with about the same volume? Today we'll review the foolproof method to set the modulation levels for a station. The only traceable calibrated piece of equipment you'll need is an audio tone generator that is exactly on frequency. Alternatively, a compact disc containing a traceable calibrated tone can be used. Beyond that, a spectrum analyzer is the only other thing you'll need to hook up to your FM transmitter chain. It's really quite an innovative way to uh, set these levels and the math is doing all the hard work. Here's how it works. So let's take a closer look at the Bessel Null method for setting modulation levels. This is an extremely accurate way to set FM deviation quite precisely at virtually any RF frequency. Let's go. If you're new to the subject, it's helpful to know what frequency modulation is and why this setup is so important. We'll avoid as much math as possible and focus on the concepts. As you can see in this illustration, frequency modulation is a one-to-one -one mapping of the amplitude of an input message signal, typically audio programming, to the frequency of an output signal, FM for short. The center frequency is known as the carrier. It's the frequency that is mapped to a zero amplitude input signal. For FM broadcast in the US, the output radio frequency is in the range of 88.1 to 107.9 MHz. The RF signal has a constant amplitude, only the frequency is changed. An FM receiver works in reverse, mapping the received frequencies back to amplitudes, thereby recovering the original message. The maximum amount of frequency deviation from the carrier is important for two reasons. First, in FM radio broadcast, it determines the overall level of sound that you hear. You'll notice that FM radio stations deliver just about the same maximum volume on your radio receiver, and that's because a standard is uh, set for deviation required by regulations. And second, since frequency modulation maps amplitude to frequency, if no limits were set on deviation, one station's frequency would deviate enough to overlap with an adjacent channel. Now when the input to the transmitter is typical audio content like music or voice, the spectrum of the FM signal appears over that entire frequency range from zero to full deviation. However, when the message is just a single tone, we get a very interesting spectrum. Looking at the output spectrum from an input tone, F sub M, as you can see on the right, we see peaks at the carrier frequency and then additional peaks with regular spacing equal to the tone frequency. The additional peaks are known as sidebands. It's a so-called picket fence spectrum because of the visual resemblance to regular spacing of a picket fence. Now the levels of each sideband are not random. It turns out that these levels can be determined mathematically from the function that maps frequency to amplitude. Sparing you the math, the end result is that the level of each sideband is determined by the well-defined Bessel function J sub n. The input to the Bessel function, beta, is the modulation index, and the output deviation divided by the frequency is beta. The Bessel function of subscript n corresponds to the nth sideband, and we count up from the carrier, which is defined as n equals zero. And you don't need to derive the Bessel function. This is a well-known function. You can just look up the results from a table or input beta and n into a Bessel function calculator. You can find those online and just get the result. If you find a list of tables for a Bessel function, one of the most common tables that you'll find in that list will give the Bessel function zeros. That is the settings for n and beta, which give a value of j sub n equals zero. Thus, with certain particular tone frequency and deviation combinations, the nth subcarrier will go to zero or simply vanish. This gives us a very convenient way to know exactly when the FM deviation is at a particular level. Pick your target deviation and determine the tone frequency that gives you a beta where J goes to zero. In the table at the left, we show the beta settings that make J sub zero go to zero for a 75 kilohertz deviation. We'll see why 75 kilohertz is important shortly. Now, when the program material consists of one of the tones in the table, we can simply adjust the deviation until we get a null. Then we know that the deviation is 75 kilohertz. Indeed, there are several conditions which give a zero, so we'll need to count the number of zeros that occur as we increase the deviation to get to, say, the third zero at 8.6665 kilohertz or the fourth zero for a 6.3602 kilohertz tone. Let's see how this works at the transmitter site. 
At a typical FM transmitter site, the program material runs through a chain of audio signal processing and then to the FM exciter and transmitter. First, if the program material is stereo, it is turned into a single channel of audio known as composite audio, which includes a mono component that's left plus right and a stereo component left minus right. The stereo component is then amplitude modulated onto a subcarrier at, well, in the United States, 38 kilohertz, and a 19 kilohertz pilot tone, that's half of 38, is also added to uh, assist with recovery of the stereo subcarrier in the receiver. The receiver then sums and subtracts the left plus right and left minus right signals to recover the individual left and right signals. The audio is also processed to increase its average volume while holding the peak levels fixed, and the audio is also high pass filtered for reasons we'll get to shortly. The output of the signal processing must be set to give a peak FM deviation of precisely plus or minus 75 kilohertz. This composite audio is then sent to the exciter, which is the FM modulator. It delivers an FM signal at its output with a power on the order of watts. The low power signal is then amplified to order of kilowatts in the transmitter and then it's sent to the broadcast antenna. The exciter and transmitter functions are often combined into a single unit these days. So here's how all of these components look in the equipment rack at our KRKQ transmitter site, which is located at 11,000 foot elevation just outside of Telluride, Colorado. On the rack shown at the right, you'll see the exciter transmitter unit above. Underneath is the Optimod audio signal processor and stereo generator. And below that is some equipment to deliver uninterruptible power in the event of a power failure. And the equipment which provides an audio link from our studio to this remote transmitter site is shown there too. You can see from the picture at the left that this is a very full site shared with a lot of other services. In order to prevent power from other transmitters at other frequencies from getting into our transmitter where it could cause problems, we also have cavity filters in line with the transmitter tuned to our carrier frequency of 95.5 MHz. You'll see those on the left. So let's take a closer look at the audio signal processing that happens in our processor, which happens to be a vintage Optimod. First, the audio is high pass filtered as shown in graph A. In North America, the corner frequency of that filter is 2.12 kHz. Higher frequencies are thus emphasized, in this case by 20 dB per decade. FM radio receivers contain a low pass filter with the same cutoff and a matched roll off. When operated together, the result is a flat response. Pre emphasis was put in place because the noise that occurs in demodulating a weak FM signal has more high frequency content and this pre-emphasis results in better signal fidelity. Likewise, the stereo content of the audio is modulated onto a 38 kHz subcarrier and a pilot tone at 19 kHz is added to aid with demodulation as shown in graph B. And as shown in graph C, in tandem with these processes, the audio levels are controlled to limit the amplitude of the output signal. The peak amplitude corresponds to 100% modulation or it must be set to plus or minus 75 kHz deviation. In the United States, the regulatory agency, the Federal Communications Commission, defines 100% modulation as plus or minus 75 kHz, that's 150 kHz total. The channels are spaced at 200 kHz, so that gives us a guard band of 25 kHz on each side. The bandwidth occupancy is actually slightly larger than 150 kHz. By Carson's rule, we also add twice the audio frequency to that. So you can see why the FCC does not place strong signals on adjacent channels. So let's set the limiter. We'll do this for a mono signal just to keep it simple. So here's what we'll do. First, we set our audio frequency to 8.6665 kHz. That's the third carrier null in the table at the left. Then step two, we set our audio input level to get output limiting from our processor. That corresponds to 100% modulation. We set the processor to mono with no pilot tone and no subcarrier. Next, step three, we set the output attenuator of the audio processor, gradually increasing the output level from near zero. And then step four, we monitor the RF output on a spectrum analyzer and we count the carrier nulls. We stop at the third null. Thus, as shown in step five, 100% modulation will now correspond to plus or minus 75 kilohertz deviation as required. So let's go to the lab and see how this is okay, done. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate the Bessel Null method here in the lab. We use a vintage Optimod at our KRKQ transmitter site, and I have a backup one here in the lab. I've connected a function generator, which is set to deliver a sine wave to the input of the Optimod's left channel. And to make this demonstration as simple as possible, I've set up the Optimod for a mono signal, thus the stereo subcarrier and the pilot tone are switched off. I've set the function generator to deliver a tone of 8.665 kilohertz, 
This is the tone that will correspond to the third Bessel carrier null. And on the front panel of the Optimod now, I'm going to adjust the input level such that the composite audio output has just gone into limiting. And that adjustment is right here. It's the left input attenuator. So I'm gonna adjust that. So I'm monitoring the Optimod's output on my old school analog oscilloscope so I can clearly see just when it's gone into limiting. Turning up the input level to the Optimod and there as I keep turning it up, I can see that it's not going up any further. So this is in limiting. This is the signal level that the Optimod views as 100% modulation and this is after pre-emphasis. So the Optimod regards this level as 100%. Okay, so next I'm going to connect the output of the Optimod to the modulation input of my RF signal generator. Since I don't have an FM exciter in the lab, the signal generator will serve this function, just plugging that in. And I've set the signal generator up for FM modulation. I set the carrier to 100.1 megahertz. I'm going to monitor the output of the signal generator on my spectrum. Okay, I've set the spectrum analyzer to a span of 200 kilohertz and an amplitude scale of 2 dB per division. This will make uh, small changes in the carrier level, easy to see. And now I'm going to start with the Optimod output set very low, and you can see that the bandwidth occupied by the signal is very low. There's just uh, the first sideband kind of squeaking through there on both sides of the carrier. Now I'm going to increase the output of the Optimod and see the bandwidth occupancy growing and you can see the carrier starting to drop. That's as we approach the first vessel null. The potentiometer is a little dirty so it pops up and down a bit. So there's the first null. Still increasing the signal level. Carrier coming back up. Bandwidth occupancy continuing to grow. And there's the second null. Carrier is gone. Signal level still going up. Carrier is back. And here comes the third Bessel null. And there it is. You can see that the bandwidth occupied is about 150 kilohertz or plus or minus 75 kilohertz. So we know that we've uh, connected everything and counted everything properly and uh, next I'll switch the spectrum analyzer to 10 dB per division and I'll adjust the null even more precisely but you get the idea here. The Bessel null procedure is one of my favorite bits of broadcast engineering. It almost seems like magic but it really comes down to the math of how FM works and then exploiting that to make a very simple set of measurements. Admittedly, we did this for a mono signal, but a few small changes will accommodate stereo. The beauty of the procedure is that we rely on the principles of FM and just the accuracy of the tone to get an accurate modulation index setting. We don't need a sophisticated modulation monitor to do this, although having one handy to check the results, that's always useful. If you plan on doing broadcast engineering work, this will be one of the most useful procedures in your skill set. That's it for today. Thanks for watching.